Today is the last talk of the DNA series. Um, we've been going through a series of talks um, exploring about uh, our DNA, how dependence on the Holy Spirit looks like, um, how we are to never give up um, in the pursuit of this freedom that God leads us to, and then that we are anchored in Jesus. Then we had two more talks um, about what it looks like to live under grace and another talk about how it looks like to live out our calling. And today I'm going to talk about what it looks like or what it is to live out the vision. It sounds big because it is. The vision, the vision that God gave uh, to the people of this parish uh, and specifically uh, today I'm going to talk about how that vision looks like for us here at St. Saviour's. Um, so we'll go and, and we'll pray again that uh, the Holy Spirit will open our eyes to see where we are to fit in this vision. Because it's great to hear about it, it's great to know about it, but what, what's our part in this vision? What, what do we do with it? Yeah. So let, let's pray, let's close our eyes and just meditate a little bit in God's presence. Prepare our hearts to uh, go through this together. Spirit of God, thank you that there is a purpose, there is a vision, and with it there is guidance. There is a place where you are leading us to individually and as a group of believers, Lord. We pray that you will transform our hearts in the light of your word and your truth, and that you will give us all the same vision and the same spirit, that we might be the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. So the vision of the parish, you may have heard this, to love, to serve, and to follow. Love, serve, follow. There's three pillars, if it were, to this vision. And we're going to go through each of them. Um, and we'll use, I, I'll use a couple of verses just to uh, give more clarity on how it looks like. So I'll talk about what, about what the vision is and then how it looks to live it out. The first pillar is love. But first we're going to read Habakkuk um, chapter 2, verse 1 till 3. Um, not so much in the context of what the prophet receives from God, but how God speaks to this prophet. He gives this prophet a vision, a revelation, of something God will do. And this is how it goes. I will stand at my watch, says Habakkuk, and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation or the vision and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time, it speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it, it will certainly come and will not delay. Write down the revelation, make it plain, make it clear, so that the people that see this vision may run, may act and tell everybody else about it, because this is something that God will do. This is something that God tells his people, and you can trust in that word that that will come to pass. And back then, God tells the prophet to write in, in, in tablets, because that's the way things were back then, you know? These tablets would be um, on stone, on, on wood, and would hang outside the gathering places or the prophet houses. and the purpose is that everyone would know what was the revelation and the vision from God to the people. But these days we have this kind of tablets. <laughs> we have all the ways and God, of course, 
He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and tomorrow, but he uses everything around us to speak to us. And today is different. Today, and through Jesus and his spirit in us, we receive these revelations from, directly from the Father to our spirits, to our hearts, and lead, us, lead the people of God in these visions that God gives. So, the first pillar then, it's love. In Luke chapter 10, verse 27, it says, uh, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and all your mind. In the same way, love your neighbor as yourself. We all know this passage. And I'll go in depth to a certain kind of love that this passage speaks about. Romans chapter 15, verse 30 this is Paul, says, Dear brothers and sisters, I urge you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to join in my struggle by praying to God for me. Listen to this. Do this because of your love for me, given to you by the Holy Spirit. Do this because of your love for me, given to you by the Holy Spirit. So this is not the kind of love that we might think when we hear the word love. On look, maybe. Maybe you do. This is the agape love of God. A different kind of love. It's not the emotional love. And it's, not, it's not human love that will let you down. This agape love from the Father, the very essence of God, is perfect. This is the love that casts out fear, that makes a heart whole, and that heals wounds, and that heals people, and that reach out, reaches out to people. This love purifies the heart and reconnects us with the Father when we receive Jesus as our Lord. Agape. And I will show you my story because my story is a story of this kind of love. If you met me when I was 17 years old, you, you would have met with a girl that had to cope already with life at that age. Every decision I needed to make to move forward in life seemed like I was groping for light, if it were, just trying to open a door in a very dark room for air, for light, for something better. I strived, and I felt weak in life. I was very young, but nothing made, made sense to me. I felt very weak, and the weakest spot was my heart. I didn't feel loved, I didn't feel that I received enough love, so to be happy, if it were, um, and I felt like this. I felt broken and empty um, and lost, and I struggled, like many of you, probably, or not, but we're all human beings, so I, I really guess that we've all been there sometime. Truth is that I could I could have never gotten out of that dark place without Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ represents the passionate manifestation of God's love, this agape love in my life and the life of those who know this Jesus. And as good as this love is and as needed for my life in that moment, it was God's people, the people that got it right, the people that knew this love because God reached out to me through people, through his people. I always speak about how God restored my heart and delivered me and put me in this spacious, open space. I always say that if you knew me before, and many people say, oh, I would have you know, loved to know you when you were like this and that, and you wouldn't even recognize me. But that's a true story. But there's another story in the Bible that really... Um, always led me to identify with, with, this, with this person. So I read it to you, and you will find Jesus' heart in it. Luke 7. Um, Luke 7, from 36 to 47. I'll jump some of the verses so it's not too long. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, 
She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Blah. This is the meditation of his heart. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Verse 44 says, Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has, she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. I will never forget where I came from just because I know how much God forgave me. And I don't think that uh, all of the people who love God a lot uh, have been like this woman, very like awkwardly sinful, but I think that that people really recognize and acknowledge how much they've been forgiven. What's this place that God took them from? And sometimes it's not visible. Sometimes it's not a place, you know, I coped. You know, when I, when I knew Jesus, when I met Jesus, I, I, I was struggling, but I was still alive. I, you know, I would have had a normal life uh, compared to others. But then he transformed my life. And I'm a different person. So do you really know how much you've been forgiven? Have you experienced what it is, the depths of this forgiveness? Do you see the value in Jesus' crucifixion even, when God forgave you all your mistakes? The revelation alone can transform your heart forever and enable you to love with his agape love, because this is what happens. You receive Jesus as your savior, and his spirit, the very essence of God, comes and starts living in you. His love starts abiding in you your heart. He enables you to love from that open space, from that place. Not that you need to struggle to love others. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, I really need to love this person, you know, this doesn't come naturally to me. You don't, I mean, it's not a commandment that if you fail to follow, Jesus will love you less. You're, you're, you're not getting it. The only way of loving like Jesus did is from that place from the Spirit of God. It's not possible for us human beings to take this human love and try to stretch it, modify it, but on our own strength, for us to be able to love others. The only way we're able to love, like Jesus calls us to love, is through His Spirit. And this leads me to speak about serving. That's the second pillar of this vision where God is calling us to. I will read John 20, 21, verse 15, and, and a couple of verses more. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, Son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked this question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. And he continues to say how this person would die so he would glorify God, etc. And at the end of verse 18, he says, follow me. 
And we'll go to that one a bit later on. So serving, it seems like it's completely connected to this love. The kind of service that God's talking about in his words, and the kind of service that even Jesus did by going to the cross, is different maybe from what we think service is, even here at church. So we're called to serve from this place of love, of agape love. Um, it's okay if you do things because you just enjoy them in church or outside church and you serve all those. It's completely right. But then the heart of it is what matters to God. Everything you do, you are to do it like before the Lord. And that's worship, whatever you do, with a heart of love and knowing and of a revelation of who God is for you. So we love and we serve from that very heart and from this essence that God implants, if it were, in our hearts. So God calls us to love, to serve, and to follow. But this service is a service that impacts lives, that transforms you when you serve, and that transforms people when they are served. Because this is not an organization. This is not a charity. This is church. We are the body of Jesus Christ. And there's life in his presence deliverance, healing. The same God that healed in the past is here today and will be there for you tomorrow. But the fact is, do we believe? That's the question, I guess. Do we believe in this God that calls us to this love, to this kind of service? So I really want to encourage you to choose to believe this vision for your life and even for us as a community as we come together. He placed you here for a reason. So don't hold back and be the person that he made you to be. I will give you an example of someone that got it right. Joshua 14 verses seven and eight says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land of Canaan. I returned and gave an honest report, but my brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. For my part, says Joshua, I will wholeheartedly follow the Lord my God. We've been through the DNA series just to target the hearts of everything, to awaken to the truths of who we really are, and not to live with one foot in and one foot out, because actually, what's the point of doing that? But I will read the vision and how it looks like at the end. It looks like this, Acts 2, chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. The believers from our community. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to the fellowship those who were being saved. So we are to see the picture of God's vision, if it were, for us. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't come easily because Loving, you know God is a very personal, if you will, a relationship, very intimate. You're home, you're at church, you enjoy his presence. It's quite comfortable. You know, you receive, you receive, and that's completely fine. You will continue to receive until you're not in this world anymore. There's always something else God wants to give you. But then there's the service part. 
And then there's the follow part, and that's the third pillar of this vision, and that's where the challenge begins. Following is where our hearts are proved, where our love for him is tested further, if it were. You might be very convinced that you love the Lord, you know, like, like Peter. You know I love you, Lord. What do you want from me? With that kind of attitude, you know, you know I love you. And yes, there is something else. There's this fall of facts. You love me? Show me that you love me. Demonstrate that you love me. Feed my sheep. Take care of the people that I love. And that's not only for us and with one another. People love with the same love those people out there. People you know that even if they, they, they're not struggling or they don't look like they're struggling, like I did. I didn't look like I was struggling. Outwardly, I was all right. But there was people that believed that I needed Jesus, and indeed I needed Jesus, Jesus back then. So I encourage you to take a leap of faith, if you were, and follow Jesus today. We'll have prayer ministry in a couple of minutes, um, and we'll pray for you. If you're new today, it's a great opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior and start exploring and experiencing what it is, this agape love that you're called to, what kind of service it is that God requires from us and from you, and how it looks like to follow him. Truth is that when we follow him, we see him and this love into action. We see this love in action. He's the only reference of this kind of love. Him going to the cross is the ultimate service, if it were, from this heart of the Father, from this love. What else can be done? There's nothing that can be added to that sacrifice, to that act of service in love, but we are called to love and serve with the same heart. And following him maybe is a step more, a step further in maturity, in knowing who we really are and who we are called to be in him. So as ever, this is a choice. And we'll pray in a minute. And this might come as a challenge to some of us and that's all right because we will grow we will continue to grow if not we're already dead somehow this is life worth living i want to encourage you there's nothing dull there's nothing boring about living this life with god with his spirit in you this is a life worth living. And this is a vision worth following, I assure you. A vision about this kind of love can never fail. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, search our hearts during the next couple of minutes as we meditate in your presence, Lord. Show us what you want us to do, where you're moving us. Give us this vision of a church that speaks about you but actually walks like you. A church where your spirit dwells, where lives that hurt are changed into something beautiful, clothed by your grace. And show us what we can offer to you. What is there to change? What are the areas of life where we still are to follow you? Holy Spirit, we want to touch God's heart with our offering so his glory might descend here in Tollington and beyond, that more and more people will praise his name forever. We offer ourselves, Lord Jesus, and we pray, use us for your glory in this place. Amen.